You're listening to Freight Famous, presented by Rose Rocket, bringing you the people that make trucking move from behind the scenes into the limelight. Here's your host, Justin Bailey. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Freight Famous, a podcast produced by Rose Rocket at our beautiful new Rose Rocket Studios. Uh, a new episodes of Freight Famous will be brought to you approximately once a month, where we're going to delve into topics around how you build, scale, and automate your trucking and logistics business. But we do go off track and talk about things like, oh, I don't know, monarch butterflies. I'm your host today, Justin Bailey. I'm the co-founder at Rose Rocket, and I'm super excited to introduce our guest, Scott Osland from Golf Relay. Uh, Scott is the CEO at Golf Relay. I've known Scott for the better part of five years. Um, Golf Relay is an asset-based trucking company with a very quick-growing third-party logistics arm. Uh, Scott has hands-on experience in sales, operations, business intelligence, strategic planning. He's a super good dude. Um, and he's focused a lot of his energies on producing outsized results for the companies that he's worked with. Scott also does a really nice job working with um, young startups coming up in the space. He's, he's just a wealth of information. And we're really excited to have Scott on the call today. Welcome, Scott, and thanks for being here, man. Thanks. What I'm really interested to talk about today, uh, amongst other things, is... I've always looked at these like super large brokerages out there that go from we have zero staff to next minute a thousand people and we're doing a billion dollars in revenue. And I know that there's some formula of sorts, but I think for our listeners, uh, or at least for me, I would like to really understand like what is that that they're they're doing? And I kind of we'll kind of bring that back. I'd like to hear about golf relay specific because I know you've had some uh, a lot of success. Um, and I think there's really two tracks to that. So just growing a brokerage from really concept to meaningful line of business and, and really quickly, you know, I've been able to watch this right in front of us. Um, and, and also doing that inside a trucking company um, because, you know, plainly speaking, most trucking companies who offer brokerage just don't do it very well um, at all. And so kind of really interested on that. But I think it's important that we talk about your background and how you got here to have these insights to just, you know, validate, I guess, some of what, what you're saying to be, uh, to be true. But one thing I want to go back to from a conversation we had uh, when we first met probably five years ago at this point, I would say. Um, yeah, crazy. Talk to me about butterflies. <laughs> That's where you're going to start. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And I, uh, and I want to help. I want to help <laughs> sort of tee this up a little bit. It's important because I think it's it's a story that I like to tell because I think it's, it's a it's, – it's a, well, and I don't tell it well, so that's why I'm going to ask you to tell. I think I leave, leave a lot of details out. But it's, it's, I think it really helps paint the picture of, of sort of uh, entrepreneurism and its really raw form. So if you could indulge me a little bit with, with, yeah. uh, with that, please. Yeah, sure. Um, you're, one of the, you're one of the few people so far who, who in Freight who kind of knows that story. Uh, so that, that's great. We get to share this with the world. Um, no, so I was um, when I was when I was younger, probably uh, from ages about seven to to probably twelve. I was really interested in insects. Like I was just I was really into bugs, and I collected them. And um, it was just kind of one of those things. I guess every little kid, uh, or maybe uh, most kids, are interested in that to like some degree. But you sort of grow out of it. And so I don't know what happened with me, but I I um, I grew out of it a lot later than maybe maybe some people did. And so. Um, through that fascination, um, I ended up starting to to uh, basically raise butterflies. And um, from the time they would be a, a little caterpillar, and of course you'd feed them, and then they would go into a, um, a chrysalis phase, which um, just to be technical, uh, a moth forms a cocoon and hatches out of a cocoon. A butterfly forms a chrysalis and hatches out of a chrysalis. So uh, two two different tracks. Uh, and if there's any like entomologists. Uh, that would that would dispute on that. Just make sure you always say a moth is in a cocoon and a butterfly is in a chrysalis. So um, that's why I'm wearing I'm wearing glasses today. Um, so I guess ultimately speaking, uh, what we found was there was actually demand for uh, butterflies to get released at weddings. Um, we, my family and I didn't come up with this strategy. There's actually a guy in Pennsylvania. Um, that had started doing it uh, years before and um, had figured out that, you know, instead of throwing rice or releasing pigeons, um, butterflies actually made a really nice 
um, opportunity. And so when people walk down the aisle, um, certain part in the ceremony, uh, you would have these kind of little paper envelopes and you would open up uh, the, the envelope and like a butterfly would fly out. Um, and, it, and it looked really cool and uh, very, uh, very photogenic. Um, and a lot of um, native butterfly species uh, had been on the decline because, you know, fields that used to hold uh, flowers or stuff that they would eat were being bulldozed and, you know, apartment buildings were going up. And so there's also kind of this environmental idea that um, as long as we raised butterflies that were, in, you know, endemic to that area, releasing them was a good way to kind of reinforce that population. So it kind of had these different, um, uh, I guess, you know, tears to it or this idea that it was somehow bigger than just a business. Um, at that time, this would have been probably in the this would have been in the mid '90s. Um, the, um, the 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 entomologists at the time basically had thought that um, monarch butterflies, which are kind of those big orange butterflies that you see on like National Geographic, um, they go down to Mexico every year and they overwinter. So they actually they actually migrate and then they hang from trees in these big, huge, long chains. And anybody who's kind of watched any like nature video, that's usually if there's a if there's a section about butterflies, like that's that's the the video you see, um, and that's a particularly a monarch butterfly. They're endemic to the whole United States and, and a lot of North America. Um, but at that time, um, there was a concern that the butterflies that were east of the Rocky Mountains were genetically different than the butterflies that were west of the Rocky Mountains, and um, they didn't think there was any overlap in in uh, genetic material because they didn't think the butterflies could actually cross the Rocky Mountains. The elevation was too high. And so because of that, um, long story short, this individual that was raising monarch butterflies and, and releasing them at weddings in the East Coast, he could not fulfill any West Coast orders because the Environmental Protection Agency wouldn't let him do it. So he contacted uh, my dad um, and uh, said, hey, are you interested in, in starting a butterfly farm in Sacramento, California, and essentially fulfilling all my West Coast orders because you can raise butterflies out there. And as long as you stay to your Western side and I stay to my Eastern side, EPA is happy. We don't have any problems. My dad uh, was a firefighter. And so he had some spare time because their shifts are, they work about 10 days a month. And so he had some, some extra time to do that. He said, yeah, sure, let's, let's do it. So he involved me in the business. I think I was probably about nine years old at the time. Um, so we started raising butterflies and, um, you know, we had a uh, some marketing and stuff like that that we did. And um, man, it, it really took off. We ended up being featured in the Wall Street Journal. We were in uh, Martha Stewart's Wedding Magazine, which at the time, pre-Instagram, pre-Facebook was kind of like the it thing. Um, and uh, and the business like exploded and really, really took off. Uh, my whole family was involved in it. We grew the feed plants um, all the way uh, through the process. And then we would feed the caterpillars. We would essentially, um, we, we reared them in these um, temperature controlled laboratories that we built. Um, and then they went through the whole process. They would come out of their chrysalis as a, as a full grown monarch butterfly. Um, and then we would put them in these little paper envelopes live and we would overnight them um, to the, the scene of the, of the wedding. You'd get them kind of the day before. Um, and uh, then they, they'd go down the, the aisle or whatever and release them and um, it became a thing. And so the business is still in place today. Swaltoe Farms is still a, a going concern. We sold the business um, uh, quite some time ago, uh, because it just grew too big to where my family wasn't prepared to kind of go all in and have my dad quit his, his, his job and everything and his pension. And so we, uh, we ended up selling the business to a, a great guy who still runs it today. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the background. I, I just simply love that story. And thanks for the education on butterflies. A, a couple quick comments, one somewhat freight related even, um, we, in our backyard, I, we have monarch butterflies in, in here in Toronto. Um, sure. and, uh, they, they migrate down, I guess, to Mexico, uh, which is really remarkable when you think about that. And uh, we actually have them, we live in a, a sort of behind us is a, is a ravine of sorts where, where a lot of them congregate. And usually sort of late September, um, we'll have hundreds of them over a couple day period. It happens really short, maybe 48 hours, just like blasting over the house, starting to head down to down to Mexico. And I I don't know how they make it. It's, it's remarkable. But I guess on, on the, the freight side, the quick question I have on that is, how do you put a butterfly in an envelope and not have it get crushed in transport? I, I, how does that, I can't even, you know, you can't even see skids of stuff move without getting crushed, especially nowadays with the terminal backlogs. How do you get a, how do you get a letter somewhere with a butterfly in it? Yeah, so what we did is we actually, um, we worked with FedEx to design a, a box um, and the box was, was really specialized. There was two, two important things. One, monarch butterflies are unique in the sense that they do migrate. Most, most butterflies don't migrate the distance um, that, that, that monarchs do. I mean, you can imagine going from Toronto all the way down to Mexico. Um, it's a pretty, pretty harrowing journey. Um, so that's interesting is that they're very hardy. They're, they're pretty tough. Um, they can make it a long way. 
Um, so just naturally speaking, uh, they were a little bit more resilient. The second interesting thing about monarch butterflies is when their core body temperature drops below um, 51 degrees, they go into a hibernation state and they don't really use a lot of resources. Um, and so they basically go and just, I mean, they, they hibernate, they kind of, they look like they're dead. They're not, they're just sleeping. And so what we did is we put an ice pack in this specialized uh, custom FedEx box that would drop the temperature. It's insulated, kind of like a cooler, almost like you'd ship like um, if people ship you like frozen meat, like if you get like Omaha steaks or something, right? It's the same concept. It's a styrofoam cooler that had a, um, a special um, a disposable uh, gel pack in the bottom. And that would drop the core temperature to a, a little bit below 51 degrees. And so when we ship the butterflies, they're totally dormant. They're not moving around. They're not going to damage themselves. They're, they're not being stressed. Um, and you could ship them, you know, overnight, no problem anywhere in the country uh, with that. And then when you take them out, uh, you just have to take the top off of the cooler and let it come to warm temperature over a couple of hours slowly. You don't want to put them in like a hot car or something, but you let them come up to temperature. And when they exceed that, they start to kind of wake up and, and uh, go from there. So, yeah, it was it was a unique in the sense that the Monarch was really built for that because they hibernate already. Um, and we just we kind of piggybacked off of nature and in, in doing it that way. It's Quite amazing, and thank you for sharing. I think it's an amazing, uh, for anybody who's interested in just learning about different types of businesses, I find, you know, one of the, when I talk to people about being in the transportation um, space, and certainly, you know, from where I sit now, it's it's much more software, but prior to being in the software space, I was in the services side of this business. Yeah. And yeah. the thing I, I probably most loved about my time in this space was learning about all the different types of businesses. I mean, there's just, it's, it's so amazing that, I, I, you know, it would almost be on a daily or if not, you know, I guess a weekly basis where I would say, I can't believe there's a business that does something like that. You know, <laughs> yeah. like all the time yeah, you come across stuff like that. And, and I love, you know, this is a, another great story. Like I, who knew that business existed? And, you know, again, if we had more time and, and you know, wasn't gonna bore the listening group, I'd, I'd really wanna dig into the unit economics of this whole thing and the, and the inventory <laughs> management and all that, but we'll talk about that when I, when I see you in Dallas, I think I do. I actually wanna dig in, in more on this, but, you know, in the interest of time, um, you know, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, we've gone, th we've gone through your background, so, we, you know, we kinda know where you've been, and so kinda moving into uh, you know, current day, um, I'm really curious around Back when I sort of led off with around, can you talk to me about some of these large brokerages? Um, you know, and then maybe our listener base is a, is a smaller brokerage. They're getting started. Um, maybe they're mid-sized looking to get to that next level or, or wherever they are on their journey. Um, they're most likely not C.H. Robinson. So, you know, and, and, and maybe that's not even the right example because of the sort of the legacy nature of, of that business. But when you look at some of these ones um, that, are, that, that I see sort of, you know, through through LinkedIn and, and, and some, you know, you'll see stuff in freight waves, you know, around, you know, multiple billions in revenue. And these are companies I hadn't heard of two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, this probably isn't an easy answer because if it was, everybody would do it. But how, how do they do that? You know, my, so, so my, my perception is that um, brokerage, truckload, particularly truckload brokerage, you can you include LTL and that include refrigerated, right? But that, that kind of, um, core brokerage product that all of us are more or less familiar with today. I, I think that it's, I mean, it's a people first business, right? It's a sales business. You have people that depending on how your model is set up, you have people that are selling to a customer and then you have people that are selling to a carrier, right? Or in some case you have the same person doing the same job um, where they're on both sides. And so my perception just at a very, very 30,000 foot view is when you go into places um, like folks with a blue logo down in Austin, or you go visit the folks with the green and black logo up in Chicago, right? Um, and you sit with those people. Um, it, it is, it is. There is a culture there of sales and hustle, um, with a focus on on customer service that really typically sets um, a, a brokerage that that hits a billion dollars in revenue from the people who don't. Um, that's been my experience, you know, and I'll, and I'll pick on I'll pick on Coyote in particular because I have a lot of friends that came out of the Coyote environment. Um, you know what they built at Coyote from a culture standpoint, in my opinion, is is just incredible. Um, and I had this experience where um, I met a lot of people in Coyote over the past couple of years. And when you would walk into a room, the energy, the perspective, the focus that they had on the customer was something that was just drilled into them. Um, and I even had the experience of going down to Mexico because we work with a, a group down in Mexico that um, essentially does some some nearshoring for us and gives us some team members down there that um, are able to augment our, our U.S. based staff. 
And a couple of the people who are at this new company came from Coyote. And I actually didn't know that. Um, separate company, right? Or separate country, excuse me. And I was in the room with a couple of them and we were just kind of talking and visiting. And then afterwards I asked like, hey, what were those two people's background? And they're like, oh, they came from Coyote, Mexico, right? And you're like, instantly it makes sense um, because that brand, um, they were able to distill that brand down into a set of principles and then they hired people and then they drilled into them what that looks like. And in a different continent, in a different, or excuse me, in a different country, different language, different everything, I recognize somebody who didn't train in Chicago, right? They, they grew up in, in Guadalajara, Mexico, and they got hired by Coyote. And that culture transcended a national border, transcended a language barrier, and was it was implanted into this person. And, and it, it, I'll never forget it because I think the best brokerages today um, that are in the most, that are in the highest growth, I think if you sat down with those leaders, um, you know, you would hear from them that, that it is a people first business. And that that culture that they've developed around hustle and doing what's best for the customer and really going the extra mile, as simple as it sounds, that is what separates, you know, the average people from the people that are going to really hit that. We can definitely dig into more around technology and, you know, maybe there are other aspects to that. But in my opinion, um, the folks that I've seen be successful, that that culture is drilled into them from day one. Do you think that's because they've separated the, 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 you know, you alluded to there's the, the sort of the buy and the sell side in, in these larger businesses and then the, maybe in the smaller mid-sized ones before you kind of grow into that that stage or maybe you do it earlier days. I, I tend not to see it as much with smaller businesses. Uh, sure. That you know, generally those smaller business will have, you know, sort of quote unquote a dispatcher and they kind of handle, you know, sales does the selling, they bring the customer in and really from there on the customer experience going forward is largely handled with the dispatch team. Sales will interject, you know, with there's, escalating problems or expansion opportunities, but sales is really paid to bring on new business um, right. or prospect in some, in, in, you know, partially as well. Um, but what I've, what I've often seen, and, 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 I, and I don't know this, and I don't mean this as a, as a criticism, it's an observation and it's somewhat of a, a I think it's a personality trait, is that in dispatchers generally, you know, 50% of the time, if not more, are having to deal with carriers. Carriers are uh, rougher, uh, that you know the way in which you would deal with the carrier is a lot different than you might deal with the shipper, and mm -hmm. so context switching and just turning it on and knowing it, you know, it just doesn't work. You know, so yeah. you will find the experience dealing with dispatchers largely um, to be one that that is it's 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 truthful, it's direct, but it's generally not very soft or or what you might want to classify as customer centric. So, do you sure. think that it, it it requires you breaking those those rules apart, or or could could you notice and see? even in the, the more operational side of the business at Coyote, that that culture still permeated there too? Uh, to use yeah, Coyote as an example. No, I think it's a good, I think it's a really good question. <clears throat> I, I do think that um, as a brokerage scales, you, you eventually reach a point where you do have people who gravitate towards talking to carriers and you have people who gravitate towards talking to customers. I mean, we, I see it in our business. You know, we, we started out, uh, in 2014 on the, on the brokerage side. And then especially in 2017, everything we did was kind of what they call cradle to grave, right? You have one person that kind of, we talk about spinning in the chair, like you talk to the customer and then you spin in the chair and you talk to the carrier. Um, we broke that up in 2018 and really separated because what we realized is, um, there's people that just naturally gravitate to, to either side. It's not a good or bad thing. Um, you can have a super successful career in, in both areas. Um, but we had people who enjoyed talking to planners at a shipper or enjoyed talking to uh, dispatchers uh, at a carrier or talking directly to the driver. In some cases, if it's an owner operator or it's a smaller trucking company. And yeah, I think a big part of, of scaling that is just understanding your people's personalities and where they're going to be best suited and then putting them in a place where the customer they own, whether it's carrier or, or, or the shipper, um, they are, they become masters at working with those people and, and getting, giving that person or that, that, that entity, giving them the value out of the brokerage relationship that they're looking for. Right. If that carrier is trying to always get back home in Atlanta, um, because they've got a, an Atlanta based shipper and it gets them to California, but they ride broker freight from California back to Atlanta. Well, you know, as the carrier sales rep, like my job is to get the carrier above market, um, you know, goods or a good above market freight out of California back to Atlanta. Like that's, that's why they call me. Um, 
And then on the other side, you know, on the shipper side, it may be, may be completely different. You know, it's that once our routing guide fails at, at step three or four, um, I have 30 or 40 loads a day that I've got to source on the spot market. And so for me, um, the shipper sees the value in just, you know, getting that stuff done and maybe price isn't quite as important um, because we already know we're paying more because it's on the spot market. Right. So you just finding people that, that can work in both worlds um, is not uncommon but finding someone who is a master at, at both worlds, I have found is, is a lot more challenging. You, you reach a, 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 an inflection point where you need to go one direction or the other. And usually the organization is best suited if you, if you are able to make that decision. There's something that, that I thought about through this. I, I read an article last week, and if you're unfamiliar with it, we can, we can pivot to a different conversation. But I feel like you, you're a generally informed, uh, informed dude. Um, now I have to say I read it. So I, yeah, I you better. You'll be. You'll, yeah, no one <laughs> yeah. will know the difference. Um, the the Ch Robinson um, Navisphere uh, move to really it looks like. So I'm gonna I'm gonna summarize it in my view of this, where they're they're moving towards looks like basically the elimination or really the the, the heavy duty consolidation of carrier managers in in favor of uh, really a carrier portal. I'm sure they'll dress it up much prettier than that. But effectively a, a portal where they can, you know, shippers, or sorry, carriers can log on and book their own loads and really do their own work that currently carrier managers do for them. Um, yeah. I, I get it in terms of chasing the Uber freights and the convoys and trying to, you know, position yourself in, in that market that way. They're a publicly yeah. traded company. I appreciate the, the overhead that goes with, with roles like that. Um, yeah. I think the... The blowback there is somewhat obvious, uh, and from 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 the carrier side of things. Um, but I, I'm I'm torn really on it being a a band aid of sorts, where this is probably the future anyway. So I mean, do it now or do it later. You're going to be doing it. Uh, versus a little bit of what you sort of led off with there is 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 moving away from the relationship component of this. So big businesses are you you led with big business, the relationship based businesses. This really does commoditize in some ways that relationship. So I'd really be interested in your thoughts, especially from probably both both hats. So as a carrier, you know, who probably picks up loads for Robinson, you know, there mm-hmm. would, that would have to happen if for, for a carrier of your size, um, yeah. and, and as a broker too. Um, so you know, maybe if you can kind of ping between the, the two and give me some perspective. Yeah, I think it's a I think it's a fascinating question. Um, <clears throat> I will say um, my mind is is not fully made up on it. Um, so I'll say that first and foremost. Um, but I think there's a couple of components that you that we should think about as you as you talk about that, because I think most brokerages, I don't care how small or how big you are, they are focused on digitization. I mean, that that is the future. The value of a brokerage is really all about connecting a supply and demand market. And if you can connect a supply and demand market more efficiently, you will win. And so if that efficiency means uh, a portal, then great. If it means an app, if it means a phone call, whatever is most efficient is typically what the market demands, right? Um, and that's why you've seen Convoy and Uber be really successful um, is because once they got that flywheel going, um, while they certainly don't own the market, this is a, a huge market, um, they've carved out a very meaningful niche with carriers who want that, right? Um, if you're at Convoy, and I was on the phone a couple a couple weeks ago uh, with them talking about some other stuff, you know, they're very focused on their app adoption. I mean, that's that's it. Don't, you know, we're not asking you to call in the Convoy and have a, a conversation with us. If you're using Convoy, you're using our app, right? And um, and everything's flowing through that. So I think that's one angle. Um, I think that, so, so I think overall, there's tremendous market pressure, to, to your point, to move to a, a as frictionless of a transaction as you possibly can. And I think all brokerages, uh, freight or otherwise, are always in pursuit of that, right? On the other hand, um, the thing that that sort of rattles around in my brain is, you know, we look at the American truck driver statistically and and demographically, you know, they are still they still skew heavily um, post forty. Um, you know, most of our drivers are are in the uh, you know late forties to early fifties range, um, and uh, you know they are are very good at what they do. Um, but I I don't know I don't necessarily know that um, if they all want to use an app or if they all want to go to a portal to try to pull down freight. I mean, when you're on the road for long periods of time, sometimes it's nice to talk to somebody. Um, we have you know, we, we have plenty of, of uh, folks in our office that will just call drivers on a regular basis and, and ask them how they're doing. You know, they've been on the road for six days. Maybe they're headed home. Um, how, is, how did your week go? Um, because it's just, it's a lonely job. Um, so I don't know how much of an aspect of 
of that is is still needs to be present if I kind of like put my my brokerage hat on in order to um, maintain that carrier loyalty um, or how much people just want to take it directly from an app. On the other hand, if you look at um, you know the millennial generation and and then now the the zennial generation coming into this, we know that the zennial generation, um, while their parents may not have directed them to drive a truck, we know statistically many of them will because um, there's going to be an exodus of the senior uh, truck drivers. And we know um, statistically that autonomous vehicles from at least a regulation perspective leave off the, the um, you know, the technology side are, are, are not going to fill that gap. Like there, there's no way. Um, so there's, there's going to be a need for folks that were raised with a smartphone in their hand um, to, to then get into the cab. And so the question will be, um, you know, is, does that skew that, that swing and accelerate that adoption where, um, you know, if I came of age, if I'm, you know, 21 years old and I'm eligible to drive a truck and let's say three years from now, you know, I absolutely was in, you know, high school and everything else with a smartphone. And so I don't know that I want to call somebody. I don't call my bank. Right. I don't I don't do any of that stuff. I, I do everything over a phone. So I'm, I can only assume that from C. H. Robinson's perspective in the market, they're they're betting that that demographic, um, you know, is going to take over um, statistically. It's 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 going to happen. And, and they're just they're kind of riding that wave. So. It's, that's great insight. And you actually alluded to something too. And in, in the world of autonomous trucks, um, that's the way it's always, that's all the way it's going to be. It's, it's system right. to system talking is really what, what we're moving right. towards, right? And this is the, um, it, it's, it's, I think it's an interesting talking point because obviously when, you know, a, a company of that size makes a move, it, you know, it sends ripples throughout the industry and creates the conversation. I think it brings to the forefront, you know, what everyone has known that's been going on, but it's almost been, colloquial to a point uh, where when they do it, it's like, oh, this is actually happening. It kind of feels like, EL it almost felt like ELDs to me in a way. Like it was like, we all knew it was coming. You knew it was going to have to happen. But as soon as it was, this is the day, this is the mandate. It had a similar feel to me of yeah, it, that like tomorrow is, is now today. Like it's yeah. arrived, you know, and that, 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 you know, felt like it again. And from what I understand, it hasn't been quite released yet, but um, I, I, th I think potentially, um, a, a real seismic shift. I, I think that to me, that, that one's just, it's, I, I find myself thinking about it a lot because of the, the downstream implications and the long tail you know, implications. And I, I hadn't considered the, the demographics of, of Xennials. Actually, I didn't even know that was the term. So um, thank you for, I feel informed on Xennials and, and butterflies and I can't wait to see where else this goes. Um, so I guess to Golf Relay, if we, can, if we can just take a moment to do this, I don't want to spend a, a lot of time on this, but I, I'd be curious on your thoughts. So we're, it's February, I don't know, it's not quite Valentine's Day, but I don't know exactly what date it is, but it's 22, early February. And, um, you know, this has been a, a, a crazy, uh, you know, I want to say crazy year, but it's probably been two years, really, um, you know, from, from a, and I feel like it even started pre-pandemic. I think there was, you know, it's, it's, it's been a, it's maybe it's just always crazy and that's just what you know maybe the crazy is the new normal but you know what are you seeing now so you know dallas based um multi hundred truck you know carrier um what's happening today broadly speaking yeah. in the in the market that's a great question yeah it has felt like um i think we were we were laughing uh the other day because we have felt like um just the market volatility um it's just, it's just it's wearing everybody out. I mean, everybody in supply chain is, I think, I think weary. Um, I don't care if you're a shipper, a broker, whoever. Um, you're you're just you're just tired. I've been to three conferences in the last uh, month in January. I was at three conferences, which I hadn't been at any in in like probably a year and a half. So that was crazy. Um, and I think it was just basically all group therapy. Um, you know, we'd go to sessions, and then you'd be sitting there having a drink or having dinner, and and everybody's just like. You were, you were just worn out. Um, so I think I think overall, just industry wide, no matter where you are, touching supply chain is is just it's still exhausting, right? It's it's it, you're right. The volatility and the chaos has become the new normal. But I don't think necessarily that there's been any any one particular thing that is set up to alleviate that. Um, you know, I, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago that's very investment banking focused and very um, I would say like. Um, not macroeconomic, but like macroeconomic for supply chain focused. And, and there were some really big names up there on the podium basically saying 
you know, we don't think anything's going to change in 22 um, from a capacity standpoint, from an equipment standpoint. I mean, um, some of some of the places that we get our equipment from are some of the largest uh, dealerships in the in the nation. And and one of the th- questions they ask every single week on their internal conference call, and we know this because we talked to the, the sales guy, is if somebody walked onto my lot today and wanted to buy a 2020 uh, one or 2022 Freightliner Cascadia, how long would it take for them to get one if they had a check in hand? And right now the answer is late Q2 2023. And so um, that's just, and that's where we are um, from a market standpoint. Um, we are seeing labor participation tick up. Uh, when I was at a, a conference, one of the things we talked about on the asset side, everybody's recruiting classes are, are more full uh, than they've ever been. In some cases, we're, we're, I know here at Gulf, we've, we've broken records the last couple of weeks in a row um, from a recruitment standpoint. So we are seeing um, people who have their CDL um, come either come back to the industry, um, you know, are, are fully vaccinated and they feel confident to be able to uh, get back in the truck and interact with the public. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things. And, and again, I don't know what all the root causes are. None of us really know. Um, but we can tell from a market standpoint, there, there is, there is uh, labor entering the market. From an equipment standpoint, though, it's, it's still a mess. I don't see anything loosening uh, really this year at all. Um, I think it's going to be, it's going to be well into Q2 of next year before we see some meaningful lift happen there from a capacity standpoint. Yeah, that's, that's, I've, I've, heard, I've heard similar, similar sentiment. And, and it's almost like even when you say, Q2 of next year. It's almost like we say that because it's far enough out to believe it's possible. <laughs> that's right. But there's yeah, really no exactly. data to support that that's, that's the time. Why I say that? It just feels far enough out that maybe you could yeah. be right. You could be right because you can say that's that far yeah, away. Right? You could be right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It could move by a quarter and I'd still be like in the ballpark. Yeah, yeah exactly. Maybe that's what we tell ourselves as supply chain people is like, I don't know. The real answer might be Q4 2023, but we all would just, you know, probably quit and, 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 you know, decide to do something different if that's the case. So we'll just tell ourselves it's, it's going to be sometime earlier. Have you seen a, um, how how are the customers responding to this? And I'll give you a, a, it's a sentiment more than a data point, but it it seems to me um, that there is this, there was initially, and maybe, and and I guess my question is, is is this still occurring? um, That there was a, as usual, you know, when when things happen in transportation, I think shippers are generally con- conditioned to be skeptical around, sure. you know, it's 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 all it, whatever you're doing and telling me it's all just to get a higher rate, right? This is kind of the maybe, and I and maybe I'm being a little bit, uh, I may be a bit critical of the group and, and a little bit general, but for the topic of conversation, we'll do that. Um, and 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 then you almost there was this period where there was this. I would call it the customer shifting. So you would lose a customer, then you would gain a customer because they were all searching for the, the, the next provider who had the solution that you weren't able to provide. But this might be the time that I've never seen such a level playing field because the service and the solutions across the board are, are as you said, exo- quite literally exhausted, right? And so there isn't a better solution out there. And, and it's almost like there's this, this camaraderie amongst all kind of trucking and logistics companies for the first time. It's like, it, there's no, nothing to compete on. There's no new trucks to offer. There's no like, go after that customer because Gulf Relay just lost them and now we can offer them those trucks. They don't exist. So right. there's this, there was this customer, it felt like a customer shifting almost, you know, lose one, gain one. And you kind of, how would you describe that today? Are, there, are, are, are the shippers more understanding? Are they feeling more, you know, have you been able to drive deeper partnerships because the conversations are more you know, sort of intelligible and based on a, a climate that is, it's not like a secret trucking thing that's going on. This is this is this is like national news stuff. Everybody knows this. Like trucking and supply. I mean, up here in Canada, we've got this trucking convoy thing. I mean, it's like yeah. it's it's trucking has never been in the news so much. So it's almost like you have to be living under a rock not to know that this, this is occurring to a degree. Um, how, how are your your customers or, or for the shipper base at large responding and feeling today? Yeah. No, it's a good question. I, I will I will echo your sentiment that it feels much more collaborative and much more balanced than it's ever felt in my career. Now, I've only been in the industry for probably about 10 years, but in my in my career, I've lived through a couple of large cycles, right? The 2014 kind of uh, cycle when we had the big uh, snowmageddon and you had this big spike in volatility. And then we we lived through the 17 and 18 markets that the, the trucking markets just you know surged. And then we lived through 19, which was kind of a crash of a trucking market. And then we had the pandemic, which has been just weird in a different way. Um, so yeah, I agree. I think the, the conversations with shippers right now are very collaborative. How do we work with you? How do we make this easy? Rate has become a much lower priority than like 
loading and unloading times, drop trailer pools, uh, geographic um, proximity, right? So, so we have the optionality to say, you know, I, I really don't want to go to Atlanta. I'm willing to go to Calhoun, Georgia, right? I, we can get very specific because there's enough, de- there's enough demand in the, in the market that we can supply things kind of precisely where we want them. Um, and, and while that has happened in past times, there has, n- there has not been an extended period of t- tightness on the capacity side to this extent that I'm aware of. Um, in, a, in a very, very long time. And so I think to your point, it's not just the kind of typical every couple year spike where there's a volatility spike and there's a demand crunch. And so supply gets an opportunity for maybe six to nine months to negotiate a little bit of a, of a rate increase or maybe shed some business they don't want. Um, and then things kind of go back to normal. You know, this has been a, a, a now two year, almost longer grind on both people's parts. And so that's that's created an opportunity where um, there has been more partnership conversations. I think what the entire industry honestly is holding their breath for is um, does that persist when we see a, a either a pullback in demand or an increase in supply? You know, historically, if you look at all of the, the, the statistics, every single time the trucking market, because it is truly a commoditized market and the barrier to entry is so low, you know, as truckers, we've always added capacity um, eventually. And that capacity has always exceeded supply. It, it just always has. There's always somebody who wants to go down to the bank and get a loan and get into a truck and drive versus um, there being shippers that are opening up and growing at a point where their increased load count exceeds that. And even with e-commerce, you know, we've grown, I think the statistic I always see or hear are like, we've grown 10 years in, in the last two from an e-commerce standpoint. And so the big question there is, um, you know, is, th- is that we all believe that's a permanent trend. I mean, we buy more things at my house online, even now in Texas, the things are very open and all that, but we, we buy things online um, to a degree that we never did before the pandemic. And I would say, I, I think that's a permanent fix. Um, you know, we order groceries, we do a lot of things that we never did before. Um, and now it's become ingrained in us. So, you know, the, the million multi-billion dollar question is, does that create a, a stable demand uh, foundation that we don't ever dip below? And then does supply then really have, have a, a is the, do we narrow the gap between supply and demand in it for a longer period of time? You know, ultimately, I don't, I don't really know the answer, but I, I agree with your sentiment. And I think everybody's kind of standing around waiting to say in 2023, if the market uh, from a trucking standpoint drops meaningfully, um, you know, do you see all the mini bids come out from the shippers and do they immediately go to price or do you see some of these more conversations happening where it's like, hey, you know, we obviously the market has dipped like we still want you guys to, to, to take this freight. But, you know, either we want to have a three percent decrease extended over 12 months or whatever versus kind of the old school, you know, hatchet days where it's like, you know, hey, you have two weeks to pick up your trailers or you're giving me a six percent rate decrease on this lane, you know, and I think I think it just remains to be seen. Um, if I'm a shipper and I put myself in a cynical uh, standpoint for a split second, you know, if I look at the overall volatility over the last 30 years, like I win about 20, I win about 75% of the time, the trucker wins about 25%, you know, and and 75% of the time the shipper is sort of in control from that demand supply index. And so it's curious to see how that will all play out. Well, I think the, the, the interesting aspect of the e-com is that if you look at e-com utilization versus hard retail, it's still mm. so much smaller than I think most yeah. people would think, right? You would, you, and I'm going to get the numbers wrong. And I haven't seen an updated version of that, so I'm sure the number uh, to what you had said, you know, it's gone. We've done two years in, in, or ten years in two years, so that number is a lot higher. But last time I checked on that number, and I want to say it was about a year ago, it was something like eight percent or eleven percent of you know things were purchased online versus not. So there's so much room to grow there still. And it's, yeah. it's, it's, I think we, we kind of, you know, Amazon's always in our face and we basically, you know, they're, <laughs> yeah. they're overlording the world. And so we just kind of, you know, assume and capitulate that they've got it all and that's it. But yeah. they've really just scratched the surface. And so right. it's, it's a great question of, you know, they're, they're, it feels like it's been, it feels like there's been more freight than there are trucks for, for quite a long time. I feel like I've been saying that line for quite a while. Uh, and it's, it doesn't feel as cyclical as it once did because to the kind of joke we were making earlier, it feels more like a cycle when you, when you have a sense of when it's going to turn, but right now it just seems inevitable. And, and to the, to the, you know, so will things change at some point? Of course, it'd be naive to say otherwise, but we could be in for a long haul here. I think, you know, sort of pardon, pardon the pun. Um, I, I do, I do want to talk about, um, this is something that I think is really interesting to our listeners and actually quite interesting to me. It's something I've thought a lot about for many, many years 
when I first got into the space, I started working in, in the asset base and I quickly moved over to, to th- well, a few years, moved over to 3PL side. And, and the reason I did, and I was in the sales side of, of the world, was just the, the, the opportunity, the, the ability to sell everything and anything. I could not understand as an asset-based carrier back in the day why we would go in, pick up some skids that went over here, but because we don't go over there, we're just going to leave those ones on the dock. You know, shippers, like, we're there. The operability of a trucking company to pull in and do all the work to show up, it's like, take it all, you know? But that was 2008, and, and you know, there was, there was sort of this, like, line in the sand where you were you were a broker, you were a carrier, and the, the sort of this hybrid and what we're kind of seeing now, it, it wasn't as, as prevalent. They were almost, they were they were sort of in, in combat of each other, which is kind of hilarious when you think about the, the complementary nature of the two. Um, yeah. How did you think about approaching, you know, I know when you started at Gulf Relay, it was, it was, it was an asset-based company. Um, and, and you guys have grown, uh, you know, from my perspective, a pretty explosive, uh, you know, brokerage and managed transportation uh, system. And I, and I know you guys are very heavy in, in technology and you take a managed trans, uh, it, it's a sophisticated offering what you have. So I, I don't mean to um, simplify it because I think it's simple. I mean to simplify it for the sake of just conversation for the, for the audience. Um, how were you able to build a successful brokerage inside a trucking company? It's a great question, you know, and this is, it's a, it's something the entire industry struggles with. And, and my perception is philosophically, uh, the challenge really stems from from a few different places, um, but I think you got to come back to the customer first. Um, the customer is, d- typically speaking, the, the customer wants us as the logistics company to figure it out, right? If, if you're going to contract on a lane for us between Atlanta and Dallas, um, I, it doesn't matter to the customer, typically speaking, whether you're taking it on brokerage or asset. They just want it covered. And they want to make sure that it's taken care of. And they're using you because, typically speaking, because you have an asset. And so there's some reliability and there's, some, there's, there's perceived control there. Um, and so that's, that's part of it. But ultimately speaking, I think from the customer perspective, they, they expect you to figure it out. Um, inside the trucking company, you have a couple of different challenges, typically. Um, first of all, you have, a, you have a cultural challenge. Again, we, if we go back to brokerage, you know, brokerage is a sales job on either end. You know, you're, you're buying, uh, you're selling a customer on giving you something, and then you're selling that something to somebody else, which is going to be a carrier. And so the personalities of salespeople, the motivations of salespeople, the comp structure of salespeople is very different from an asset-based trucking company. An asset-based trucking company, you know, you're measurements are typically on time. Your measurements are driver retention and making sure that those drivers get a steady paycheck. You know, if, if my goal is to make, um, you know, a couple thousand dollars a week um, and then I, and I'm paid by the mile, well, then I need those miles, right? I, I need that. Um, and so your job as a planner is to make sure that I get a balance of my home time and my miles in such a way that I can feed my family, but also see my family, right? And that's, so th- those those two um, metrics and the kinds of people that gravitate towards those two different roles could not be more different. So I think right out of the gate, you have a cultural difference that's, that's stark. Um, and, uh, and then I, I also think, you know, lastly, some of the way that um, executives in brokerage look at the world versus the way executives or managers in assets look at the world is also different. If I'm in a brokerage world, my goal is to make sure my people um, from a sales standpoint are, are continuing to make commission and they're continuing to earn a bonus paycheck um, because that's typically why they're there. They're salespeople. And most good salespeople's goal is to fulfill a customer need in such a way that, that they make money off of that, right? And usually they're they're comped and incentivized on, on that. And then a heavy part of their compensation is variable because we want to see you perform that, that activity for us, right? On the asset side, the assets are all about options. An asset's dream world is a buffet, right? Oh, I have a driver who's uh, in Atlanta today. Oh, I have Atlanta freight I can get for that driver. Oh, I have a driver who happened to be in, in St. Louis today. Oh, I have St. Louis freight I can get. And so um, one of the, some of the biggest challenges that we've had to work through internally has really been around the fact that the assets always want access to all of the freight that the brokerage has, because in their mind, uh, a buffet is good. Uh, brokerage wants to know what assets is, is going to let them move or, or what they can keep because A, they want to make sure that they can continue to service that customer and B, good carrier salespeople are looking for their value prop to the carrier, right? If, if I'm the carrier that we talked about earlier that goes from Atlanta to LA and then from LA back to Atlanta, if I have a wonderful lane from, from LA back to Atlanta and assets 
decides on a Tuesday that they've got a, a random driver in LA and they want that freight. Well, that means my guy doesn't get the freight, right? Well, if that happens two or three times, then that guy doesn't call me anymore. And so my whole opportunity to add value to that carrier and potentially make, you know, commission to feed my family and go to Disneyland or whatever I want to do that that's taken away. And so um, I think a lot of times people in, in companies where you own both a brokerage and a trucking company, they jump straight to the comp issue and depending on your perspective, they tend to vilify um, that. And they say, well, either you just need to do this because it's for the good of the company. Usually sometimes the asset group will say that to the brokerage or vice versa. The brokerage will say, um, you know, well, you guys just on the asset side, you never commit to anything, right? You're just always looking for the option. And neither is really true, right? Both, both are true depending on the situation. And so um, for us, you know, we have found most success to be really candid in creating a defined network for both people. And we basically said, OK, assets like this is your defined network. You're going to commit to these lanes on a regular basis. Um, and so 90 percent of the freight that moves on our asset trucks today is committed is committed capacity. Like they know up to a couple days ahead of time and sometimes it's months ahead of time. You have to take these loads every single week um, on the on the brokerage side. Um, you know, they own a, a core group of lanes and carriers that really defines their network. And then their value to the shipper is is augmenting that with spot capacity. Right. Um, but we have found that to be most successful. And there's still a lot of loads that move from our brokerage to our assets and vice versa. Um, but we've had to create a safe space where everybody understands that's not um, that's not the, the majority of the freight that's happening. Um, there's there's a defined network here and we go outside of that. Um, we have to agree on what that's going to be and ultimately have to make sure that we're servicing the customer. Are you thinking about your, um, then from a broker side, does Gulf Relay really just get, for lack of a better term, treated like any other carrier in that model, that they have a carrier manager to them and really, and I'm sure there's some some nuanced differences there, but largely is is that the, the, the sort of stated goal? Yeah, largely we have made that, we have made that the stated goal. We have tried a lot of different things and ultimately what we found is um, if you align managers um, uh, uh, together and you make the managers have an adult conversation on the one-off situations where we need to have that around whether who's going to take this load. Um, if you do that and you put them in a trusting environment and you empower them to make those decisions, they typically do really well. And so we have a dedicated person on the brokerage team that works with the asset team. We have a dedicated, we have more or less a dedicated person on the asset team that works with the brokerage team. And those two people have a great rapport. They have, they have great conversations. We've tweaked their comp a little bit to make it, you know, make sure that there's no place where the company's asking them to do something that would hurt their pocketbook, might not be able to optimize it, but it's not going to hurt it. Right. Um, and it's been very successful because ultimately what we figured out was about 10% of the freight that moves on the brokerage really works for the assets on, on a, a, a typical basis. And really, um, there's, a, there's an even smaller percentage of freight on the, bro on the asset side that, that works for the brokerage because of drop trailer requirements or hazmat or insurance or all that kind of stuff. There was a lot less overlap than I think the internal teams realized. And after doing a pretty deep data dive and actually really analyzing that stuff, um, probably ad nauseum, what really emerged is that we're, we're arguing about something that is pretty, pretty small. Um, and the customer in that case tends to lose if we don't figure it out. And so our job is to make sure for that 10% where there is overlap, like we do what's right for the customer and, 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 and we're, we're empowering two managers to make that decision internally. Scott, that was amazing. Um, I think there's a ton of useful content here. Uh, selfishly, I learned a ton and I love our time together. Uh, so I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to cap cap it off there. Um, where can the, uh, the the worldwide web who happens upon this podcast uh, find Scott Oslin? Uh, I'll, you can look me up on LinkedIn and connect with me. Um, love to talk to you. I, I'm obviously a, a huge industry nerd. I, I love talking about this stuff. Um, and if I can ever be of help to anybody um, on this, please let me know. Um, and I've really enjoyed the time. I, I respect what you guys are building over there at Rose Rocket. Obviously, we've been we've been partners for a long time on some of that stuff. And um, I just appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about the industry. And well, I appreciate you uh, you waxing poetic on us, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Scott Oslin from Golf Relay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for joining us today on Freight Famous. And if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe.